I don't actually remember the last time I did one of these, but it was a while ago, and I'm now cycling through all the formats to show you people that they're not in fact dead. So because it's been requested, this is a video about what North America looks like in Shadowrun in the 2070s. Not with a precise end date, not too in-depth, because this is only high school level fictional history. And also because I haven't touched Shadowrun 6 for the same reason I haven't started a drama commentary channel. Self-respect. So this right here is the map of North America in Shadowrun, along with the old borders of North America, of the new borders, the old borders. It's a lot to unpack, and it even goes beyond the borders of this very map itself. So like all interesting stories, this one starts in 2012, when magic came back to the world. A young man named Daniel Coleman breaks out of a US government re-education camp for uppity Native Americans and finds out that he can do magic now and talk to spirits. And these camps exist because, in this timeline, let's say they've been a little more insistent upon maybe, like, getting back the land that was stolen from them. And there he is certainly the figurehead of this whole movement. There's a lot of Native Americans all across the United States and Canada who go, oh, the, the, all these rituals that we've been doing for, like, cultural reasons for a long time, they kind of work now. Like, when we do the rain dance, it, it starts to rain. Like, we use the scientific method to check if that wasn't just, like, a, a random correlation. But no, there seems to be a causal link between these two things. And that is weird, but also kind of cool. So there's a lot of communication between various different tribes. They're kind of among the first to find this out to the extent that it is happening. And so they use the opportunity to start an uprising. And what to use magic for if not to end centuries of oppression by what essentially amounts to a foreign empire having genocided your ancestors away from the land that they have instead claimed and then having stuck you, the survivors, in open-air prisons. Daniel Coleman becomes Daniel Howling Coyote and declares in 2014 that there are now Native American nations. Meanwhile, the US government, not having quite wrapped their heads around the fact that there's magic now, goes, hang on, you that's not allowed, you can't do that. And also they enacted horrible violence against the uprising. So a civil war ensues, and in 2017, Nan Shamans decide that it's time to go nuclear against the US infrastructure and perform the Great Ghost Dance with which they make several major volcanoes across the continental United States and Canada erupt. So in 2018, the Treaty of Denver is signed, wherein the US and Canada cede land to these Native American nations, some of which then get the genocide cannon and turn it around on the non-native people living on their land. This is one of the big reasons why Seattle has the massive population as a UCAS exclave in the middle of a completely different country that it does. There was a lot more independence movements, a lot more secessionism over the course of the past 20 years. Some of it had already happened before the Great Ghost Dance, like Quebec becoming its own independent thing. And eventually, the US and Canada decided, you know what, fuck it, we're just we're one country now. That's... that is what we are now. We are United States, Canada, combined, one country. But not all of the remaining states actually decided to join. Many of the southern states went, let's do a confederacy, because that's never gone horribly wrong, but not in a racist way this time, you guys. Because, I mean, at that point, the US of A had managed to overcome racism in many departments for all the wrong reasons. You'd black people and white people and Asian people sitting together at the barbecue, drinking Pabst Blue Ribbons, going, those damn metas are taking our jobs away. Oh God, they are such savages. So they were racist against tusks instead of skin colors now, for the most part. There's still actual, like, traditional racism, which I guess that is progress? I do love the fact that uh, the Confederates got a, a woman president before the Union did, 
essentially. Although the Union did have a dragon president for a few hours, even before that, so maybe that cancels out. California also decided to leave, by which I mean they were kicked out of the Union for reasons that I personally still don't quite fully understand. In Mexico, the drug cartels had decided to form the Oro Corporation, which means gold, because they discovered that they had so much money that they might as well form one of the biggest legitimate businesses the world had ever seen. And eventually they figured out that through this corporation and the control of the underworld, they basically owned Mexico on almost every single conceivable level. And they saw the great ghost dance happening and they went this i we like this hi uh is this the historians the archaeologists and the advertisement firms yeah we would really like you to basically develop a new identity for the people of mexico that also harkens back to its native american roots specifically the aztecs that would be really cool yeah and then in 2015 they just rebranded mexico into Aztlan, and later rebranded themselves from Oro into Aztecnology. And let's just say that Aztecnology's heritage of being born out of extremely brutal criminal cartels kind of still shines through in some of its business practices. And as business ventures go, Aztlan was a very successful one. They became a massive expansionist military power and local empire. Supported by one of the biggest mega corporations in the entire world, they went to war and they conquered. They took a big bite out of what had once been uh, the southern fringe of the United States. They basically conquered all of Central America with the exception of the Caribbean. It literally took Amazonia, which is controlled by a great dragon, to stop their advance. And even there, the borderlands are, like, shaky at best. Which, speaking of, the Caribbean League was created exactly in response to Aztlan becoming like a big ravenous beast that is going to eat you but it's not as much a government as it is a diet eu it's a collection of really quite different states that have decided to band together as a geopolitical power block to avoid being eaten by the ravenous beast and now that we have covered the basics of the history we're going to take a look at every one of the individual countries that have sprung up out of this thing in North America and also, of course, Central America. And let me warn you that I will be mispronouncing a whole lot of these because they come from a lot of different languages and I don't speak that many. Now, some of you may think that the new Native American nations would know better than to emulate the USA they replaced and not fall victim to ultra-capitalism, but the Olonquian Manitou Council is the prime example as to how this did not, in fact, happen. They tried for a while, but after a crop plague that basically ruined their food supply, they just invited Ads Technology into their new land for their industrial and agricultural expertise. Fast forward a couple decades, and they basically have a complete stranglehold on the nation's economy, with the only others with any pull here being Mitsuhama, Renraku, and Zedekrupp, all of whom are AAA megacorporations. The Manitou minority, which at that point was not even part of the nation's name, were one of those ethnic groups that became metas at a much greater rate than anyone else, most of them becoming elves and adopting a very green ideology, which didn't work at all with the council's hyper-industrial course. After a brief civil war, they got some concessions, like, for instance, having their tribe in the name, but ultimately not much has changed. The Athabascan Council did a slightly better job at balancing business and conservation, and they can afford a little more independence because they have oil money. Essentially, they pulled a Norway and founded Ather Oil, with which the government could make money exploiting natural resources while at the same time spending some of that money on its populace and ecological conservation projects. The megacorporations still have a strong presence here, but they don't essentially own the country. The Athabascan Council was also one of the first nations to recognize Sasquatches as Metasapiens, with full citizenship rights. These rights do not, however, include the right to vote or participate in the government, which is only granted to you if you're descended of the First Nations, which only make up about 20% of the population, so 80% of the country 
doesn't even get to vote, which some people sometimes complain about a little bit. We've already talked about Aztlan, but essentially it is only technically an independent nation with its own political parties and free elections because factually everything is controlled by Azt technology, and that includes the criminal underworld. Even large parts of the nation's military is just Azt technology corporate forces on a government contract. It also has a very strong authoritarian bent with extremely strict controls on migration and being a high-tech surveillance state, but also a lot of freedom when it comes to owning weapons, which is part of the country's martial culture. A lot of very brutal forms of entertainment are legal in Aztlan as part of the national identity, which also includes their own form of Spanish, which they redesigned to include more Aztec grammar and vocabulary. So after the California Free State was essentially abandoned by the UCAS, it was still very powerful economically, but pretty much defenseless militarily, making it a prize to take for its many bellicose neighbors. With San Diego, the first big city was lost to Aztlan, and so in their desperation, California asked around the world for a patron to protect it. The Japanese Empire was happy to heed this call out of the kindness of their will to conquer and get that prize piggy for themselves, essentially turning California into an imperial colony and ANCAP paradise for the Japanese megacorporations. They weren't particularly good at protecting the free state though. Los Angeles fell to the Pueblo Corporate Council, Tietengia still occupies vast swathes of its northern territories, but at least San Francisco is massively racist now. Also, the Japanese government decided at one point to pull back from California, but the local commander was like, no, and just stayed and basically ran the place like a fascist dictatorship for a while. I won't go over all the nations in the Caribbean League because there's a lot of them, but some interesting ones include the Haitian Republic, which is still quite poor, extremely racist against metahumans, and controlled by an almost theocratically inclined voodoo strongman who attempts to wield his influence of this not unpopular religion for the sake of geopolitics. Jamaica is almost the opposite, being extremely tolerant and liberal, even to vampires, and essentially the Los Angeles of the Caribbean when it comes to media production, supplemented by a very strong agricultural sector. The Republic of Cuba plays host to the League itself, but is actually a neo-communist stronghold against the influence of the megacorporations, specifically at technology. It provides the biggest part of the League's navy, which is ultimately, let's be honest, just pirates who shoot Aztlan ships when they see them. Because of local cultural ties, the southern tip of Florida became the sovereign state of South Florida and part of the Caribbean League instead of joining the Confederacy with the rest of its state. Speaking of, the Confederation of American States didn't use the flag you might think it would on account of it being racist as fuck, by which I mean old school skin color racism, which wouldn't have really played too well with its huge African American population. Here's my favorite bit of CAS history. Texas got invaded by Ants technology, but when CAS tried to send its army to protect it, they declared themselves independent as the Texas Free State, ended up getting military support from UCAS, the army of which was still bad at magic, so they lost, then Texas became part of CAS again, which then barely managed to stop Aztlan. In keeping with its historical heritage, it basically kept metahumans as slaves until the 40s, when international sanctions forced them to afford them equal rights. Even worse, they still use Imperial units. UCAS has switched away from Imperial units in favor of the metric system. But the South still uses them. To explain the Front Range Free Zone, imagine pre-unification Berlin, but it's Denver, and the reason it's split is because a very important treaty was signed here, and all the signatory parties have to have a slice. Also, it's factually controlled by a dragon called Ghostwalker, who just showed up to kick Aztlan out because he didn't like them, but otherwise respects Denver's role as a city where the powers of North America meet to negotiate important things with each other. The city is an economic powerhouse, with every AAA corporation except Az Technology being present there, an essential part of the global shadow running infrastructure, and also North America's most significant landlocked smuggling hub. Arguably the most powerful of the Native American nations, the Pueblo Corporate Council is both a government and a corporation at the same time. 
All citizens have shares in the corporation, which allow them to be permanent residents and vote on state matters, with more shares giving people greater political power on a logarithmic scale. So you need 100 shares for two votes, which you might argue is not really worth it. There's also other kinds of shares issued to outsiders that do not allow for political participation but pay higher dividends. This model has proved to be extremely economically successful, making the country powerful enough to essentially buy up the failed Ute nation instead of having to annex them militarily. Though it plays nice with international business, it's also a bit protectionist, not allowing for full extraterritoriality for corporate assets in their borders, but instead offering limited options that are easy to get into and expensive to maintain. The Republic of Quebec became independent in 2010 already, and, well, they are distinctly Quebecois. Being extremely francophilic, the only language allowed on legal documents is French. Everybody has to learn French, they adopted a new French currency, and they impose the same kind of strict regulations that France does on megacorporations, which essentially means they're doing everything in their power to make their economy inaccessible to foreign investment and growth, unless it speaks French. Nevertheless, business is done here. Quebec is a nation of contradictions that way. They're pretty authoritarian in their control of the media, but also were one of the first to grant citizenship to goblinoids, and, like, not discriminate against them. But also, you're allowed to just murder Sasquatches here. Remember when I said that the Native American nations did a little genocide of their own? Well, most of that happened in the Salish Shea Council, which I am 100% mispronouncing in some way. This isn't because that government is particularly racist or anything, it's just that they are the least centralized of the new nations. And covering the vast area that they cover, they don't even have real proper law enforcement that works the same everywhere. They've since relaxed a lot, becoming very friendly to metahumans, maybe even a little too friendly, because one particular elven tribe decided to make their own nation, which they did, resulting in the occasional light war happening. Don't worry though, they got to prove their military power when they conquered the formerly independent Native American nation of Tsinshan, turning it into a vassal state. Most of their economic power comes from completely surrounding the UCAS exclave of Seattle. Another one of the Native American nations none too fond of its white inhabitants was the Sioux Nation, which ended up deporting most of them and keeping a handful in some of the most messed up reservations they could come up with, as a kind of cosmic vengeance for the sins of their ancestors. Relations to UCAS are tense because of this, but so are the relations between the 20 recognized tribes within the nation, where nepotism and identifying with your tribe to the exclusion of all others are rampant. The nation is controlled by several councils where all big tribes are equally but not proportionally represented, and the government functions in a manner that is more or less democratic. Because it considers UK as a kind of eternal enemy, the border is heavily militarized, and skirmishes occasionally occur. The Transpolar Aleut Nation did this really cool thing where they said, look, the polar circle, we own it, except for these parts of it, but also we get some places that are not in the polar circle because we are really into border gore. And so that's what they did. They control a huge area centered around the Arctic Ocean, making most of their money by leasing mineral exploitation rights to various megacorporations, which allowed them to make enough money to bail out Iceland in 2029 after the big Matrix crash. They renamed it New Thule, and it's now basically the country's bitch filling its coffers with tax revenue while not really getting much out of the deal itself. Tiotangir is a word that I will never be able to pronounce ever. Even though it's a Tier nation, it has a lot of philosophical disagreements with Tier Nanog. Founded through a ruse by an immortal elf and a lot of military power, Tiotangir is known mostly for being self-righteously racially supremacist. For a long time, all non-elves were considered second-class citizens with severely restricted rights, and the country was governed by a council of princes which, though it allowed some non-elves, mainly dragons, was brutal in its authoritarianism. However, after lots of internal and external pressure, social adepts controlled by the Horizon Group managed to open up the country and turn it into what could reasonably refer to as a democracy. Still, 
ideas of racial supremacy against the non-elven minorities persist. The United Canadian and American States are the biggest and maybe the most powerful nation in North America. They are the official successors of the United States, which some nostalgics wish they could get back. It functions a lot like its predecessor, though it has inherited many of its important economic assets, as well as playing host to both Ares and Neonet, two of the biggest megacorporations in the world, at least until Neonet kind of ceased to exist. As its only territory on the west coast, UCAS holds Seattle, which is an official state of the Union, because so many of its citizens fled there after the Great Ghost Dance. And just to make this clear, the reason they control just uh, such a small section of Canada, but is still considered the successors to Canada also as a nation, is because that is literally where most Canadians live. This small area is home to the largest part of the population of the country of Canada. So the Yucatan Peninsula has been striving for independence for a long time. The Zapatista movement has been trying to establish a series of largely socialist republics there since the 90s. And in the Shadowrun timeline, they actually managed to do that 70 years later, after decades of civil war with Mexico and later Aztlan. Just imagine all the horrible shit America did in Vietnam, move it to a different jungle where all of that was done by Aztec technology and also they added blood magic. Mounting a decades-long guerrilla offensive against this actual narco state and eventually successfully gaining independence just because you never stopped fighting back is an unfathomable act of collective willpower that makes Yucatan into the most badass nation in the sixth world. So that didn't go as expected. So I woke up yesterday barely able to get out of bed thinking, oh shit, I have such a busy schedule, I will need to do a short video. And instead, this happened. This is probably one of the most work hour intensive videos that I've ever made because I, I have a big brain. Thank you very much for watching this bit of Shadowrun lore. Like, comment, subscribe. Share this to your relevant communities, but do not spam them. Consider supporting me on Patreon or Subscribestar, maybe buying some of my merchandise or my short story collection. And in that spirit, something that I really just want to say is that I love the kind of nuanced realism that the Shadowrun lore does. I mean, it's, it's wild to come up with a setting where it's just, oh, there's magic now. And, you know, cool cyber technology, how will this affect geopolitics? And many of these sci-fi scenarios will just go, this is the confederacy of non-white peoples, and this is every single subdivision of Europe, but it's now its own thing. And Shadowrun manages to strike a certain balance out of this, where you have confederation of a lot of different things, a lot of unification, but you also have uh, various kinds of secession, and all these states obviously don't have the same ideology, and every single individual actor within those states is their own independent moral agent, the way that it is in the real world. It's as complex and as dirty as the real world, and that is something that I really like. And in that spirit, see you around, cunts.